Greetings from the Petersburg Church of Christ. We thank you for allowing us into your home today, and we encourage you to open your Bible and follow along with the message that's presented today. We would also encourage you to take notes and send us any questions or comments that you have concerning today's message to the address that will be provided at the end of the lesson. We invite you to join us any opportunity that you have. We meet on Sunday mornings at 10 o'clock and Sunday evenings at 6 p.m. We also have a midweek Bible study on Wednesday evenings at 7 p.m. We are located at 205 Russell Street, just off the south side of the Petersburg Square. Someone was writing years ago, entitled The Record Book. If all the things you ever said were written in a book, and all your thoughts were on display, so all could take a look. I guess there's not a living soul who wouldn't hang his head and feel ashamed before the Lord and wish that he were dead. There is a record book, I'm told, with every deed and word. It even keeps the records of our thoughts that can't be heard. The good, the bad, and every sin, for nothing has been missed. It really makes me feel ashamed to think what's on my list. All of us stand before God and He knows every thought, every action, our motives of why we're here this evening. And this lesson on attitudes, I believe, will help us if we think about it. The book of Jeremiah in the Old Testament, right behind it, is the book of Lamentations, also of Jeremiah. And at verse 12 of chapter 1, the statement is said, Is it nothing to you? All ye that pass by, behold and see if there be any sorrow like unto my sorrow, which is done unto me wherewith the Lord hath afflicted me in the day of his fierce anger. What an attitude. Is it nothing to you, all ye that pass by? Recall in the teachings of Jesus in the Gospel of Luke, Luke chapter 10, verses 30 and 32. Notice the attitude of these two very religious people. And by chance there came down a certain priest that way, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And likewise, a Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. What was it Jeremiah had said in Lamentations 1 verse 12? Is it nothing to you that passed by? Here was a man in deep need and distress, and the priest saw him. What was his attitude? He passed by on the other side. This Levite, he saw this man in great need, bruised and bleeding, having been robbed. And what did he do? And he passed by on the other side. What was the attitude manifested? I could care less. What is it to me? You unfortunate creature, you the one that got robbed. Me not have anything to do with it. But what was the attitude? It didn't bother them. They didn't care. The careless attitude. You know, when you talk about the subject of attitudes, sometimes we don't pick up on what the Bible is really talking about and we don't realize that this is attitudes that Jesus is discussing in 
the beginning words of the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew chapter 5, beginning at verse 3, the Beatitudes, what does the word Beatitude mean? The be like attitudes. And Jesus made it clear, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Do you know what Jesus was discussing here? He was discussing attitudes. What is my attitude? What is your attitude? Sometimes our physical health affects our attitude. We don't feel good. And if we're not careful, we can develop a bad attitude. I don't know who the author was, but this is an interesting piece on attitudes. The devil's be attitudes. Number one, blessed are those who are too tired, too busy, too distracted to spend a few hours a week with their fellow Christians. They are my best workers. Blessed are those Christians who wait to be asked and expect to be thanked. I can use them. Blessed are the touchy who stop going to church. They are my missionaries. Blessed are the troublemakers. They shall be called my children. Blessed are the complainers. I'm all ears to them. Blessed are those who are bored with the preacher's mannerisms and mistakes, for they get nothing out of the sermons. Blessed is the church member who expects to be invited to his own congregation, for he is part of the problem instead of the solution. Blessed are those who gossip, for they shall cause strife and divisions that please me. Blessed are those who are easily offended, for they will soon get angry and quit. Blessed are those who do not give their offering to carry on God's work, for they are my helpers. Blessed is he who professes to love God, but hates his brother and sister. He shall be with me forever. Blessed are you who, when you read this, think it is about other people and not yourself. I've got you too. Unquote. We could talk a long time about the subject of attitudes. Uh, if you dig down to the definition of what attitude is all about, our attitude means our feelings toward things our disposition or actions. Attitude is important. It controls our living, fixes our character, and determines our destiny. One man wrote years ago concerning attitude, and I'm quoting verbatim, what you think means more than anything else in your life, more than what you earn, more than where you live, more than your social position, and more than what anyone else may think about you. We must not let poor health, old age, poverty, circumstances beyond our control, or family troubles cause us to develop wrong attitudes. And it can happen so many times. 
You know, some of our attitudes come about because of strange things. The story is told of a, of a magician and a parrot who after World War II were entertaining passengers and the parrot and the magician became bitter enemies because every time the magician would do a trick the parrot would squall faker, faker. Well, as time went on the magician pulled a out Houdini trick. He waved his wand, sprinkled the dust, and at the very moment that the magic trick was supposed to happen, the ship that they were traveling in hit a mine in the ocean and it blew it to smithereens. The next morning the parrot was on one end of the life raft and the magician was on the other. And the parrot looked at the magician and he said, okay buddy, you win, but what did you do with the ship? There are a lot of strange attitudes. Let me dig down into a basic outline for just a little bit this evening. What is our attitude about some things? Number one, what is your attitude toward truth? Toward truth. Jesus said, thy word is truth. The truth is what God says on any subject. What I say is not too important. But what God says about truth is very important. So we need to ask ourselves some questions about our attitude toward the truth. Do you love the truth? Do you really love the truth? Uh, we express ourselves and say, well, I love fried chicken, and I love mama's yeast rolls, and I love honey and butter, and I like a big sausage biscuit for breakfast. We can say that we like and love those things, but what about loving the truth? What about spending some time with this book called the Bible? What about being willing in our own minds to listen to what the truth says and accept it and believe it and love it and obey it? The person who says they love the truth and then when the truth is presented to them, they get bothered by it. Well, let me ask another question. Do you love the truth with another word? Do you love the truth and want to hear it as it is taught plainly? Plainly. You know, brethren, we have become so psychological and so uh, sociological in our uh, looking at the truth that we have missed the boat. We need to teach it plainly. Simply, kindly, but plainly. That has been my philosophy for many, many, many years. I don't want people to misunderstand what I'm saying, so I try to be plain, be frank, be open and straightforward with what the Bible has to say. Do we love the truth and do we want it taught plainly? Or do we want the preacher to mince the words and mesmerize it and completely, totally take its meaning away by his own bad attitude toward the truth that he has? Another question about our attitude toward the truth. Do you realize its value? I don't want to be told lies. I don't want those who teach classes and preach the word to come forth with an attitude that, <clears throat> well, matter of fact, that so what it says that, so why even believe it? We need to recognize that the truth is valuable. You know how valuable it is? Jesus said, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. 
lies and half-truths and traditions and dogmas of men will not set us free. But truth will. And we realize it's value. Another interesting question about the truth. Are you ashamed of it? Are you ashamed of the truth? Apostle Paul said, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation of everyone that believeth to Jew first and also to the Greek. I wonder if some of those who are trying to change everything today have stopped to realize that in reality, in their wanting to change the plan of salvation, change the worship of the church, you know what they're really saying? They're ashamed of the truth. They're ashamed of the truth. And you know what Jesus said about that? Heard this one lately? Mark chapter 8, verse 38. Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Are we ashamed of the words of Jesus? Are we ashamed to teach the truth on the subject of marriage, divorce, and remarriage? Are we ashamed to teach the truth on the subject of the church? Are we ashamed to hold up five fingers and teach the plan of salvation, the scheme of redemption that cost Jesus his blood and his life? Are we ashamed of the truth? Another question about the truth. What's your attitude? Are you willing to teach the truth to other people? You know, I'm afraid we're waiting on somebody to stop us on the street and say, would you tell me about Jesus? I've been preaching a long time. I've had very few people ever approach me and say, I want to hear about Jesus. We won't have to work smarter than that. We're going to have to have an attitude that we make opportunities. That if you, you realize this person that you're fixing to talk to, you could never see them again as long as you live. And sometimes we have short opportunities and we need to make take advantage of it. They're not going to come out and ask us to set up a Bible study. Very few do. We have got to have the right kind of attitude that we approach them that they will want to learn about Jesus and learn about the truth, to learn about the plan of salvation. Are we willing to teach the truth? Another question. Are you willing to live the truth? You know, we've got some awful good sermons. We've got some years, uh, track records of being the Lord's church. But do we realize <clears throat> that living the truth in front of people is a tremendous attitude? We are what we are because of what we are on the inside. And if our attitude is not right on the outside, there's something wrong on the inside. We need to recognize our attitude toward the truth. Uh, one kissing cousin to this one. What is your attitude toward those who preach the truth? You know, I've been around a while. I've seen a lot of things happen to fellow preachers. And I feel sorry for some of them. The way they have been treated. Neglected kicked out in the street, no place to go. What is our attitude toward those who preach the truth? Let me cite to you what the Bible says about it. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, beginning at verse 21, on down into chapter 4, 
the first four verses. Notice what the Holy Spirit gave about the attitude toward those who preach the truth. Beginning at verse 21 of 1 Corinthians 3. Therefore let no man glory in men, for all things are yours, whether Paul or Paulus or Cephas or the world or life or death or things present or things to come, all are yours and you're Christ and Christ is God. We don't need to glory in preachers. We don't need to expect glory from people as being a preacher. Our glory is not to be in men, but to be in Christ Jesus. Going into chapter 4. Let a man so account of us as of the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. But with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged of you or of man's judgment, yea, I judge not mine own self. For I know nothing by myself, yet am I not hereby justified, but he that judgeth me is the Lord. You know, if you studied your Bible very much in the Corinthian letters, Paul's apostleship was questioned by people in the church of Corinth. They was finding fault. They were bickering. They were complaining. They accused him of all sorts of things. But Paul did not let that develop a bad attitude on his part. Brethren, our attitude toward those who preach the truth. What's our attitude toward Christ Jesus? If Jesus said it, that's right. If Jesus expressed the motive, that's the way it's supposed to be. If Jesus taught what to do to be saved, that's what we need to honor. And we as preachers need to recognize that when we do not honor what Jesus said, we're manifesting a bad attitude and people in the church, people who listen to us, are going to pick up on that bad attitude. What is our attitude toward those who preach the truth? Did you notice what Paul said in that text Dig into it just a minute. What did he count as a very small thing? Verse 3 says, But with me it is a very small thing that I should be judged of you. All of man's judgment, yea, I judge not mine own self. You know, when you've had a few years under your belt, and you notice what people do and say and how they act. I know why Paul said what he did. You need to count it a very small thing when people who hear you or pick up of something you wrote or listen to a radio program or an internet broadcast, uh, count it a very small thing when people judge you. And you know who Paul understood was going to judge those who judged him and who would judge him finally. In this text of scripture is quite clear. He said, I judge not my own self. But who is Paul trusting in? He's going to let the Lord judge him. And George said, Lord, do it right. The Lord knows every angle. He knows every motive. He knows the truth that some people don't even have inkling of an idea of why you said what you did. What is our attitude toward those who preach the truth? <clears throat> Let me dig in a minute. I've seen all kinds of things through the years. And I say this with kindness and firmness. <clears throat> you know, some people go to the worship of the church only if their favorite preacher is there. Only if their favorite preacher is there. Well, let me say this from the heart. If you come to this assembly or stay away from this assembly because of the man who stands in this pulpit, 
You know what you're guilty of? Guilty preacher worship. Guilty preacher worship. It doesn't make any difference who stands in this pulpit. If they love the truth, then teach the truth. It doesn't make any difference what their name is, how tall they are, or how broad they are, or what kind of clothes they've got on. That doesn't make any difference. The difference is our attitude toward those who preach the truth in the worship of the church. <clears throat> There's a half a dozen more things that we can talk about. Uh, but let me just kind of <clears throat> hit a couple things and we'll close. With all my attitudes tonight, <clears throat> what is your attitude toward the work of the church? You may have thought that my position on the worship and work of the church is something that I'm the only one who has that position. Or I've only taken that position in the last year or two because I'm preaching here at Petersburg. My attitude toward the work and the worship of the church has been an attitude that has been developing for years and years and years. Nothing recent, nothing new. Some people have never figured it out yet, the difference between the work and the worship of the church. The work of the church is not the worship of the church. The worship of you and me is to be done in spirit and in truth. <clears throat> and at the assembly, when we meet together in the name of Christ, to perform the five avenues of worship that God has put in motion. But we can sit and sincerely worship with all of our being and say every word of the songs and believe every word of our prayers and listen to every word that the preacher preaches and observe the Lord's Supper and give and please God and worship God. But that's not the work of the church. No, that's not the work of the church. The work of the church is <clears throat> helping people who have been burned out. It is helping people who are hungry, people who need clothes, uh, people who need salvation. We are to tremble as we work out our own salvation with fear and trembling, as Paul told the Corinthians. What is our attitude toward the work of the church? Well, some people have the attitude. Let the preacher do it. Let the preacher do it. Well, can one man do all of the visiting and work and going to the hospitals and, and doing all the teaching? Can one man do all the work of the church? Can you trust him to, in your absence to take care of your work for the church? I don't believe he can. We must do our own work. We must have the right attitude. There's some people that are absolutely oblivious to what the work of the church is. And they go out into the lifestyles of our present uh, society and never feel one compunction to ever do anything in the name of Jesus Christ for the advancement of spiritual things in our society. Some people have the attitude, I'm going to do as little as I can. I was preaching on this some years ago, and, and I kept talking about, let George do it. Let George do it. Well, one of the men in the church, his name was George, and his wife got tickled. And uh, she come out laughing. She said, Brother Bird says, says uh, you kept talking about let George do it. She said, and that dawned on me what she was saying. We can't let George do it. We can't let somebody else do what we're supposed to do. We can't have the attitude, do as little as I possibly can. And on and on we could go. Apostle Paul said, as much as in me, I am ready to preach the gospel. And he did it. He had a tremendous attitude about the work of the church. 
I don't know who put this together, but it's quite interesting. Let me close with it. That goes from the past. Henry Stetson. You heard of Stetson hats? Henry was a cousin of the hat maker. He came to Oklahoma. He was preaching for the Baptist Church. He was a good preacher. He enjoyed great crowds whenever he spoke. Well, some of our brethren approached Henry Stetson about a public discussion about the differences between them and us. Well, in Ardmore, Oklahoma, where they lived, there was a very studious man by the name of J.W. Chisholm. And they proposed to get a debate or a discussion between Henry Stetson and J.W. Chisholm. They went for three days in debating the subject. At the end of the discussion, they decided to have another one. They moved to another place in that area and began discussing and debating again. Well, at the third day of that discussion that evening, Henry Stetson got up as if he was going to speak. And you know what he said? I quote, if Elder Kism will take my confession, I'm ready to go to the water and be baptized for the remission of my sin. Needless to say, it closed the debate. Stetson held a revival in that very community which resulted in 40 to 50 baptisms. And Henry Stetson spent the rest of his life preaching in church Christ. Isn't that interesting? J.W. Chisholm must have had a tremendous attitude. Henry Stetson must have been receptive to biblical truth. He responded and obeyed the gospel, became Christian, and preached the gospel the rest of his life. What a tremendous attitude. May God help us to realize that our attitudes make all the difference in the world. We don't need to be cocky and hateful and prejudicial. We need to be kind and simple and sincere and straightforward, honest with what the Bible has to say. We need to have the right attitude ourselves. If you're not a Christian, why not become one this evening? If you're listening to this program this evening and you see what we're saying. What's your attitude? Do you love the Lord? Do you care about what the Bible says? Are you willing to take the truth and let it be your guide? If we can help you in any way, will you come while we stand together? If you have questions or comments concerning today's lesson, you may send those to Petersburg Church of Christ, 205 Russell Street, Petersburg, Tennessee, 37144. Or you may email us at Petersburg Church of Christ at hotmail.com. You may also request a copy of today's lesson through the same method. Be sure to include today's date along with the station on which this program aired and the title of the lesson. We hope to see you again next week right here on this station at the same time.